Kia ora and welcome to the Niggly Niche Cast. I am the Diggly Duda Doc, as always, joined on the other end of the telephone line by the wobbly, wiggly wild card, and we are here combining our forces to talk about the New Zealand Aotearoa Warriors and ahead of their game against West Tigers after they had a nice little round one victory over the Canterbury Bankstown Bulldogs at home. Um, the niche case we are here after the recent events in Christchurch just to continue to provide positive energy, abundance, love, prosperity and peaceful energies to everyone. Sport is a uh, important vehicle, and of course, entertainment, music, all of those things that we love here at the Niche Cache are important vehicles to keep pushing forward and keep spreading the good vibes. So it's assalamu alaikum to everyone in Aotearoa, but it's our duty here to lead the way in moving forward and providing those beautiful, wonderful energies. And with that. I go to the wild card because I believe we have some Kiwis taking part in March Madness wild card. So first of all, Talofa to you. Second of all, how the fuck are you? And third of all, who are these Kiwis taking part in the March Madness? Uh, yeah, g'day. Um, not too bad. And of course, here we go. Um... Uh, six New Zealanders partaking in March Madness this year, the old college basketball extravaganza. Tobias Cameron is an Abilene Christian, they're a 15th seed, so probably don't expect too much from them. Quinn Clinton and Dan Fotu, Dan Fotu of course the younger brother of Mr. Isaac, a uh, tall black um, big fella. They are both at St. Mary's, an 11th seed, so you, you never know, they might do something interesting. Matt Freeman's at Oklahoma, Matt Freeman of course... Um, little bit of an interesting one there playing at Oklahoma he's just down the road from um, Stephen Adams at Oklahoma City Thunder and there was an article a couple of weeks ago in the um, one of the OKC papers about how you know Matt, they were profiling Matt Freeman and they talked about Stephen Adams and they said yeah when he first got over he um, he sort of sought him out and called him up and said yeah Matt um, you know good on you chasing your basketball dream two Kiwis over here in Oklahoma City in Oklahoma State you know we um We'll look out for each other. If you ever need anything, give me a buzz. And Freeman said he's hardly spoken to him since, but that it was real, like, comforting at that time to just have a bit of a yarn with Stephen Adams as you're starting off in your basketball journey. That's, I mean, I couldn't imagine many things better than that. Then we've got Sam Timmons, the um, Otago fella, also a number nine seed with Washington. And the fella you really want to watch out for here is Jack Salt at Virginia. Jack Salt in his final season, he... He's playing for a, a one-seed team, so Virginia have a pretty bloody good chance of going relatively deep in this competition. He doesn't, um, he doesn't play, you know, every minute for the team. He's sort of like a, um, a guy, you know, a big fella used to play for the Breakers Academy as well, and I'd, I'd suggest he's a real good prospect if the Breakers are looking to get back to one of those good old-fashioned Kiwi big fellas next year when he's finished his college. And say so Jack Salt's a very very uh, high possibility option to chase there. Um, he's sort of like, I'll put it this way, he, he's a guy who might play 30 minutes one game and play like five minutes the next, but he's a team captain. He's just a good old-fashioned Kiwi basketball who just like does what needs to be done, will do whatever he needs to do for the team. Pretty much what we expect of guys like um, Stephen Adams. So Jack Soldier's following in on that, um, that on that fine example set by Kiwi Steve. Kiwi basketball is over in the states, mate. Doing the business. So that's six Kiwi lads involved in the March Mayhem. Yeah, six lads at five teams. Righty, I'm gonna. That's the same number of Kiwi halves in the NRL oh there you go <laughs> this week and that's a that's a pretty prophetic number to have in March Madness and in the NRL so in the NRL you've got Timari Martin with the Cowboys you've got Cody Nakarima with the Broncos Benji Marshall with the Tigers Karen Foran with the Bulldogs and Dylan Brown 
with the Parramatta Eels and Sean Johnson with the Cronulla Sharks. So that's a fairly hefty list and there is a there is a nice segue to the Warriors because the Warriors do not have a Kiwi half. So they are not one of the teams with the six, one of the six Kiwi halves in the NRL, which is fine. Like it's all good. It's all good because if that's what it takes for the Warriors to be good, that's what it takes for the Warriors to be good. But it's a, I think a broader idea that I've just thought about is the Aotearoa Kiwis halves depth. Like I've just named six players who are in contention for a half spot. And obviously International Rugby League there's a there's always injuries, there's always suspension and like availability issues. But like there's a high chance you never see Karen Foran play for the Kiwis again. Like based on the footy he's gonna be playing for the Bulldogs, which I can't imagine is gonna get a get him like he's I can't imagine he's gonna be playing at a level better than Sean Johnson, Cody Nikarima, Tamari Martin, and or Dylan Brown emerging on the picture as well. So just an interesting idea to raise there. What did you make of Kieran Foran's uh, performance for the Bulldogs? Because it was a weird one because he was back at Mount Smart Stadium against one of his former teams. Yeah, I didn't make much of any of the Bulldogs' performances in that game. I don't think there was particularly anyone who, like, uh, lit the scene on fire there. Karen Foran is gonna, he's gonna like do a job. He's a good old fashioned, reliable. Um, now I would venture to say veteran halfback at this at this stage, or you know, by left wherever he finds himself. But he's just like, I don't know. I don't. He's there's no creativity on that team, and you have chuck him next to old um old uh, what's his name with the big boot it's not um miss mr lachlan it's not gonna it's not gonna do a whole lot i just don't see them they're a rubbish team this is what i'm coming around to saying the bulldogs are not going to win many games this season regardless of what kieran foreign does which i guess is pretty prophetic then with what you're saying about the kiwis because yeah that's not a that's not a particularly desirable situation lachlan is the most australian name you can have yeah, especially when you can call him Lockie. Lockie oh. Lewis. Lockie Lewis. Doesn't get I don't more think, Aussie than that, does it? I don't think Lockie Ferguson is a Lachlan. I think his name is actually like um, Lockie as in like locksmith, like key and lock, because it's spelt L-O-C-K-I-E. Yeah, that's the one. So it sound, it's, that feels like it's an actual Lockie Lockie, not like a Lockie Lachlan. Yeah, I don't know. It could be. It could could well be. I'd have to do some research on that to find out. It's one of one of the one of the great mysteries. It is one of the great mysteries in in New Zealand sport. If that's true, though, like, you know, thumbs down to his parents for giving a person a nickname for a name. It's just one of those. It's one of those things you don't need to do. <laughs> like your name's Stevie or some shit. Yeah, or, you know, Bill or something. Oh, this is this is my son Gaz. Hey, I I bet it's happened before. I mean, in the case of Gaz, that's one of those ones where I think the um, whatever government departments in charge of these things registering births or whatever, that's one of those ones where they just have to step in and block it. Because I mean, I've seen some of the the names that get rejected on on those um those baby name list things, and yeah, there's some there's some iffy ones there, but Gaz would not be one of those. That would not be controversial. Rightio, Warriors versus Tigers. Yeah, fire away. The, what did you make of the Warriors? Like you, you said the the Bulldogs were fairly mediocre last week. Did that have any impact, like on how you viewed the Warriors' performance? Yeah, a hundred percent. Like, I don't see what I mean. There's there's some things if you, particularly from from your uh, more um, studied point of view, looking for little aspects of their game and combinations and strategies and stuff like that but sitting from further back where I was you're just like cool like they scored a lot of points they won quite well nice convincing way to start the season I'd chill on any hopes based particularly like based specifically on that game I'd chill on too many season hopes there and I'd, I'd even venture to say that having a peek at um 
having a peek at their games to come. They've got the Tigers this weekend, Seagulls week after, and the Titans the week after that. I mean, I'm going to go on a little bit of a limb here and say that those are the four, probably going to be the four worst teams in the NRL this season. And if that is indeed the case, I think the Warriors would be disappointed if they're not 4-0 and after the first month. And if they are 4-0, and which they should be, I expect we're going to see a lot of... Um, a lot of people talking them up as, you know, big old superstars and in, the, in a way which I don't think they would have earned. Not to say that they can't be that team or even that they're not that team, just that you can only beat what's put in front of you. And when what's put in front of you is like yesterday's dinner, it's not it's not the best. I reckon the Tigers are pretty good. The Tigers might be all right. Like they had a good win last week, didn't they? So uh, I... to be honest, the Dragons should be in the bottom four too, so. I'd suggest the Tigers could probably make the top eight. Yeah, sketchy, but I mean, they're they they could be around there. It depends, because I mean, the Eels should be better this year, shouldn't they? And the Raiders should be better. So there's a few other teams that are stepping up. The Knights should supposedly, oh, they say this every year now with the Knights, but they should be a little bit better. I don't know. Someone's going to have a dumb injury and just fall off the fall off the wagon completely, though. Affirmative. The the big thing for the Tigers this week will be having Moses Mbai back in the fullback jersey. And in the video, I kind of compared the return of Moses Mbai to the return of Isaac Luke, who was a chance of coming back as well. And who do you think is more influential to their team's performance, Isaac Luke or Moses Mbai? Well, I'm going from Isaac Luke by a by a bit of a distance there in terms of one he's just he brings an extra option to that position that the Warriors probably really quite need is something that we've talked about a little bit on this podcast before and you know Warriors working with a, uh, a steady hand and Blake Green and their young half and Adam Kier and you you want a bit of playmaking coming from your um from your dummy half as well someone who can just like run the ball when there's an option there someone who can kick pretty well and Moses and Bay comparatively, I mean, I, I, I'm not actually convinced he's a fullback. Like, I'm not convinced that's his best position. He can do fine there. He's got a, he's got a little bit of footwork, a little bit of pace. I don't. I mean, it's hard to it's hard to judge him too much because he used to be a bulldog, and the bulldog is uh, like the antithesis of creativity. So maybe I'm I'm holding that against him too much. And in a better circumstance, he'll be a bit much better player continually. Um, yeah, I don't know. Isaac Luke's a better dude right now, though, and more important to his team. Isaac Luke is... He's one of my favorite Warriors, and I'd, like... This, Same. This is, this is a very interesting question to kind of um, just drift away from the Tigers-Warriors specifics here. But who is your... Like, after that one game against the Bulldogs, but, and a bit of history here... Who is who are your favourite Warriors? Are we talking current team or all time? Current, yeah. Okay, current. That's much easier to answer then. I would, I would wager a suggestion along the lines of, well, Tohu Harris would be right up there. I think just the uh, the sheer excellence of someone like David Fusatora is always a joy to witness as well. Um, somewhere along those lines but I yeah in terms of the absolute best player to watch yeah you can't really go past Roger Tuivasa Sheik but like your favorite yeah well I just like watching the best yeah right. like um I was thinking I can't remember what the circumstance was but I was thinking about this the other day how rewarding it is to just witness people who are the best at what they do do what they do to their best abilities and Roger Tuivasa-Shek, of course, Dali M, winner last year with room to improve on top of that. It's just like a, I believe the saying is a joy to behold. Yeah, you've you've stolen my thunder there because Roger Tuivasa-Shek's my favourite, uh, pretty much my favourite rugby league player, let alone my favourite warrior. And it's, it's, it is mind-boggling how someone can be not just one level, but like numerous levels above everyone else in terms of footwork and power in that footwork and the dynamic nature of that footwork and 
just how like robust they are it's it's absolutely crazy because when he we saw it last week against the bulldogs every time he returns the footy you're expecting something to happen you're thinking who can he get between here because he kind of just like if he's not running hard and fast he's angling across field and you're just waiting for any moment he can step and step between defenders and it's it's just beautiful and then he's building like an all-round game where like the play last week against the Bulldogs where Blake Green was on the right side of the ruck then he moved to the left side of the ruck and then he got the ball on the left side and he passed it back to the right side where Tui Vasashek was and like all all that green action so that movement of green moving to the left and then passing back to the right all of that like created a bit of time and space for Tui Vasashek and you knew as soon as he got the footy something beautiful was going to happen because like the defense isn't rushing up on him so the defense is either staying on their staying where they are or they're if anything they're moving back back and they're sliding and you've got no hope against Tui Vasashek in that situation it's just like there's no player in the NRL who just gives you that feeling of just joy for me it's just the it's the purest sense of rugby league joy when you're watching Tui Vasashek in action Oh, but what about old mate James Tedesco? He's, he's the fella that I keep seeing as the number one fullback in the NRL, which is a little bit odd to look past the reigning M champion. Tedesco does have the last pass aspect to his game, though. Yeah, that is true. Like he, his, he does his, have an excellent little... His handling is is a, is a couple of steps above Toy Vasashek, but it, they're very different as well because Tedesco is more like a silky speed whereas yeah I know what you mean yeah Tui Vasashek like it's 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 personal preference I I prefer that the way Tui Vasashek can gather speed and power from a step from a bit of footwork there's nothing like it in the world I reckon well he can like burst off either feet and with a change of direction in a way where Tedesco has a bit of a step to him, sure, but he's also like stronger and likes to glide through, um, likes to glide through defensive lines in a way, just like angling that run, drifting past sort of thing. And obviously, I mean, would you would you say there's anyone else in that tier of fullback in the current NRL? Tedesco, Tuivasashik. I'm struggling to think of anyone, eh? Not of the, not of that like, pure... like not at that highest level, yeah. Like if Kalen Ponga was playing fullback he'd be in contention for that kind of uh situation but he's not playing fullback so he's not a fullback the one to watch out for and someone who received huge praise i'm not saying he's in that in that bracket jerome hughes for the melbourne storm i've never seen him look out of place in the nrl and he he received like like Craig Bellamy was saying he's like was fantastic in round one, and that's he wasn't even the Melbourne Storm's best fullback, and we haven't even seen Jerome Hughes play consistently in one position in the NRL yet. And but whenever he does play fullback, like I remember we, I think we might have recorded a podcast like a couple of years ago, and it was after a Hughes game at fullback, and you were saying like how awesome he was. In the future, I think we're going to look back at how the Melbourne Storm had this like this just unparalleled big three sort of era where, you know, Slater, Kronk, Smith. And I think we're going to look back on that, um, look back on that era and look back at the era that f- is we're just, you know, that we're probably two seasons into now, the one just beginning. And we're going to look at the transition between those two and just how excellently they sort of like passed the torch between each of those three. I mean, Cam Munster is already a superstar. There's a there's a few notes on that because first you've got the next wave of Melbourne Storm. They're at like the key players are Kiwis: Jesse Bromwich, Kenny Bromwich, like Jesse Bromwich and Nelson Asafa Solomona are the best two like middle forwards in the world 
along with like Jason Tamalolo. But if that's if you two of your three starting middle forwards are Jesse Bromwich and Nelson Asafa Solomona, wow. Then you've got Jerome Hughes, and then you've got Brandon Smith, who was the starting Kiwis hooker last year when they were fantastic, and he's kind of playing as a lock forward for the Melbourne Storm off the bench. You've got uh, two young forwards coming through the Melbourne Storm as, as well, junior Kiwis like Kalma Tuolangi and Caleb Milne, who are playing reserve grade up in Queensland. So you've got that that whole next wave is going to have huge Kiwi NRL involvement. And like then you've got someone like Cameron Munster. He was, he was taken out of reserve grade in Queensland. Like, he wasn't, like, a, a celebrated prospect. He was a gun for the central Queensland Capras, I think. And then, he, and then Melbourne Storm recruited him. But he's not someone who was, like, through the system and through all these other systems and, like, Australian schoolboys, New South Wales schoolboys, or Queensland schoolboys, whatever. That's Melbourne Storm. That's the Melbourne Storm legacy. They find they are the San Antonio Spurs. They find guys who like shouldn't that no one else knows about. Even someone like Jerome Hughes. He was with the Cowboys. He was doing alright with the Cowboys. They played a bit of NRL footy. But the Melbourne Storm snapped him up before anyone else could. And now you've seen the value because he plays he plays plays in the halves, he plays a um fullback as well, so yeah, San Antonio Spurs or maybe also New England Patriots. So <laughs> take that how you will. Um, so let's like angle back on the old Warriors here. What did you like? I'm kind of curious to know what you took. What you took as the Warriors expert from that like week one game? Like, what's your your major learnings, as they would say in the Black Caps? It was just the laying down of the the foundations for 2019. It was just the this is how we play our footy. And we play it at a high level. And if you're not at that level, you're going to... Like, there was a a term that I had used last season that didn't really feel... I wasn't comfortable in putting it out there after the, um, the terrorist attack in Christchurch. But I'll say it now with the context around, like, how uncomfortable I am saying it. But I did refer to Mount Smart last season as the Mount Smart Graveyard and part of that was that opposition teams in a rugby league context you can have your soul snatched by the Warriors and that's what it felt like after the Bulldogs I didn't use those terms because of the situation but that's how it felt like the Bulldogs would have been like oh yeah rugby league 2019 let's go let's go we've done a huge preseason. everything's going to change Kieran Foran's back healthy you know we're, we're going to be okay we've put the past behind us and all that you come to Mount Smart against this Warriors team you're leaving demoralised if the Warriors lay down their, like, how they want to play footy and their execution, because the Warriors play with an intensity, a, a level of fitness, a level of execution, and their style of footy is going to fuck you up over 80 minutes because they're shifting the footy, they're passing the footy, they're offloading the footy. So the footy is always moving around, and, like, there's... I need a stat for this. I need a I need a gauge for this. Like how the minutes for each like play. So someone plays the ball and then passes it. Like the the time from ruck to ruck. Because I think the Warriors they keep that that the footy in play for a long time so you're just constantly chasing the footy around like that's the thing about Isaac Luke he'll get out a dummy half he'll run 10 meters forward so he's already made 10 meters he'll like he'll touch a defender like get a little fend on a defender and then he'll pass the footy so he's already he's run 10 meters and then he's shifting the footy so that's like that's already 
5, 10, 15 seconds that have gone in that play. So the defence has to chase the footy, they've got to keep moving, then they've got to try and put pressure on whoever's doing what for the Warriors as well. You can't keep up with that for 80 minutes. The thing for the Warriors is trying to maintain that over the course of a season. That's why their slip-ups were so extravagant last season because it was year, it was year one of the project with Alex Corvo. But the, the style of footy the Warriors play, and like you mentioned Tohu Harris, the players they have. So if you're not trying to exert so all this energy to try and tackle Roger Tuivasa-Shek or exert all this energy trying to stop Ken Mamalo or David Fusatua. Then they just pass it out to the edge and Tohu Harris is running for like 160 metres off, off 16 runs. And then you've got Solomon Ikata. You're trying to tackle Solomon Ikata. And then you're Peter Hiku slipping and sliding and twisting and turning everywhere. Jazz Tavang is getting out of dummy half and he's wiggling all over the show. Roach is darting. And then you've got Parsi and Afoa. And Lachlan Burr's mobile, big and strong. Like the start, like everyone just looked at Sean Johnson in terms of like a star playmaker. But what the Warriors have is everyone in the team and this was evident against the Bulldogs, everyone in that Warriors team is hard to tackle. You're not dominating many tackles against those Warriors players. And when you combine that with the style of shifting the footy, playing fast, up-tempo, and then kicking long and winning those early tackles, sitting the fullback, sitting the wingers on their backsides and driving them back, it's demoralising. It's the moral, like that's when the Warriors are at their best and they're laying down how they want to play footy, which isn't going to be easy because you're going to come up against teams like Melbourne Storm, Roosters, Rabbitohs, whoever like emerges as the best NRL teams this year. They are going to, instead of allowing the Warriors to dictate how the game goes, they are going to try and dictate how the game goes but if the Warriors are laying down how they want to play footy it's demoralizing because you just you just you just realize how off the pace you are you realize that your whatever you were doing up to that point is not going to win you any NRL trophy so what's the flip side of that for when they don't like when they come up against a team that is completely motivated and can back them like back up against them with size and skill and the forward pack and all that a team like the Rabbitohs or the the Roosters or the Storm like it, I think you're you're probably pretty bloody accurate with those three in terms of them being the the three teams out in front um early season favorites like what is what is plan B when they can't dominate a team? Is it like just rely on the defense and take those big moments? Are they that kind of team, or like how do you think they will go against those tougher opponents later on down the line? Well, I think the the big thing is being able to do whatever that was, whatever the whatever I just talked about for yeah. eighty minutes. Because if you can do it for eighty minutes, then you are you're going to be in the mix for those games. But we did see against the Bulldogs, like the Warriors didn't really do it for 80 minutes because somewhere in that second half, just after half time, the Bulldogs were in the game. The Bulldogs were there. They were they had, you know, come out from the sheds, they were fired up, they were playing well. So it wasn't like a complete 80 minute dominance from the Warriors, but what I saw from the Warriors in that patch is what I think can help them in those situations moving forward against the better teams. They they have the ability just to stay in the grind, which is something that Stephen Kearney tried to lay down before ushering in. Like his first season was kind of about like establishing the grind. And then he lay added the layers on top of it with Alex Corvo and different players and different coaching staff. What keeps you in the game against those better teams is being able to realize that you might not be able to dominate them, but you have to go set for set. 
you have to you have to stay in the grind in the flow of the game in the rhythm of the game and then see what happens after that period you know around the 70 minute mark around the 75 minute mark so you have to you have to kind of sense what's happening in the game and just be able to fall back into and this is this is where I'm encouraged because Adam Kieran's got a massive left foot boot Blake Green is a fantastic organizational uh, footy mind. Isaac Luke can, you know, we saw last season, he can kick a 40-20. So you, you can, you've got the players to be in the grind, and then you've got someone like Isaac Luke who can, you know, we're in the grind, 40-20, bang, out of dummy half. Suddenly everything changes. But against those better teams, it's about the Warriors... Not necessarily putting their style of footy away. Just going set for set. Just being having the nous and the understanding just to go set for set. Um, their defense is very good, so I think they can be confident in their defense and confident in how they operate defensively to stop the opposition scoring points. But it's just that willingness and that eagerness to go into the grind. And we know they're fit enough. We know they're mentally strong enough because all that hard work has been done. So now, like, I don't really have any um, anything but optimism that they can get into that grind with those better teams. The Warriors strike me as a team as well that aren't going to make very many mistakes and they're not going to give away a whole lot of penalties, which is always, you know, absolutely essential in those games. You just you, you make errors and you hand over momentum to the other team and if you're handing over momentum you're not in control of the game. You're being you know, that's how that's how you get the game dictated to you. So I they do seem like based on where they were heading last year, based on the early uh, inclinations of this season, they do seem like that kind of team that um they they don't make things easier for the other team regardless of uh, you know, because that's one of those things that's about taking care of yourself. I don't think that's something that will um that won't be able to be translated against better teams. And just on the like demoralizing thing, like we saw last week against the Bulldogs, Lisa and Armel comes off the bench. Oh, Lisa, I miss him so much. The beautiful Lisa. And he's coming off the bench with Jazz Tavunga at the moment. Hopefully Jazz Tavunga stays in the team because like you think of the difference in trying to tackle Lisa and Armel to trying to tackle Jazz Tavunga. That's a nightmare. You got to be completely zoned in to stop either one of them, but you have to be completely zoned in to stopping them in very different ways. So you're like thirty minute mark, everything's all right. You're competing with the Warriors. Bang, Lisa and Armel's in his in, into his work. Jazz Tavunga's like just doing whatever Jazz Tavunga does. It's a completely different story. So it's like it's those different looks, it's those different um, shapes and sizes and different angles that they run that um, adds to that picture um well what else do we have to say about the warriors then <laughs> what are you what are you looking Not for this lot. week against the tigers Sorry? what are you looking forward to this week against the tigers i'm just looking forward to the step up there we go away from home against the better team what do the warriors do because as i said they laid down the foundations for how they want to play footy last week very encouraging so how, what do they add on top of that away from home, tough environment against the good Tigers team? What do, they, what do they lay on top of those foundations? And on that note, is there anything else to add or are we um, cruising towards the finish line? What's uh, quick? You can finish with a quick word about your dragons if you, if you, if you insist. <laughs> I, I, I don't think I do insist. They're just like... I don't know. They came up against um, a big, very competitive Ford pack from the Rabbitohs and a guy like Adam Reynolds who just always kills the Dragons with his absolutely pinpoint kick in game. And the week before that, they got Jason Taumalolo in like a, one of those 11 out of 10 games. Like, I don't know if you saw that one, but he was so good. He was just like unstoppable in that game. And what are you going to do when your Ford pack is missing... Lisa Narmel, who was your best um, bench option previously. Tyson Frizzell got injured. And Jack DeBellin is currently uh, legally occupied. So, yeah, it's um, 
they're a little bit under strength in those in a couple of key areas and it shows immensely and but all I hear about them is this criticism about the whole thing of playing three halves and Widdop at fullback and I mean if it was up to me, I'd slide Corey Norman to full back and have Widdop in the halves just because you want Widdop, even if it's his last season, you want the ball in his hands as much as possible. But I don't know. I think they'll I think they'll come good enough to, to make the top eight. I don't think they're going to challenge for top four. And I think, um, I don't know, they'll be lucky to win a playoff game. But they're better than they've shown so far and they've got guys to come back. But, geez, it's been bloody ugly, mate. It's been awful. The first two games were just shocking. The second half against the Rabbitohs was... The thing is, I was just talking about the Warriors not making errors. The Dragons have been making errors all over the park. Um, what do you know about this Rubber Lava guy playing wing? Because I didn't realize he actually was... Is it? Did he go to Christchurch Boys High or something like that? He's Fijian, but apparently he went to school in New Zealand. Yeah, it was one of the one of the Christchurch schools. They, I think he was in the Crusaders, like junior night system really? as well so i think he goes all right oh well, he's done nothing in two weeks but you know young fella <laughs> he'll learn to catch the ball soon enough radio wild card we will be back with uh i think we're going to come back with some stephen adams chat so stephen Ooh, adams wouldn't mind that yeah uh basketball podcast over the next few days so keep an eye on that otherwise stay tuned to the niche cache and we've got plenty of lovely content coming your way. Big cheers to you all. Peace and love. Bye-bye.